And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, loved ones, we've said it before tonight, and we will say it again right now. Happy Easter. Amen. Can we just give Jesus one more hand? Praise the Lord. Happy Easter. Note to self, wherever Joel is, he's coming out. Next time we plan Easter next year, note, pastor still needs a voice at the end of the worship set. All right, but that's for all the goodest, all the best reasons in the world that that's a struggle right now. So praise the Lord. Let's open up our Bibles to John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. John 20, 1 to 18. If you do not have a Bible, our ushers are coming forward right now. Just put your hand up, and we want to put one in front of you. All right? We want to make sure you have a copy of God's Word. We believe the Bible is the authoritative, sufficient, inerrant Word of God, and it is our final authority. All right, and so we're going to go into it again. (laughs) Thank you, bless you. We're going to go into it again and again and again tonight because if we're not in it, there's nothing to say. If we're not in God's word, there's nothing to say tonight. And today we celebrate the resurrection of our triumphant king, Jesus Christ. And make no mistake about it. The resurrection is a very big deal. In fact, it is the single greatest event in all of human history. And that is not a word of an overstatement. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single greatest event in human history. And you say, well, why is that? Here, tune in. Hey, kids, 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 kids. Where's my kids? Eyes up. Oh, I see it. I see eyes. Where else? I see them. There they are. Kids, you ready for this? When someone at your school asks you, why is the resurrection so important? Here's what you tell them. Ready? Got your pens? Let's go, kids. Here it is. The resurrection is the definitive picture of victory of life over death. It is the definitive picture of the victory of life over death. And we live in a world right now that is consumed, so afraid of death. And yet the resurrection stands in the face of that and Jesus says, I've overcome it. The resurrection is the definitive picture of peace over fear. We live in a world right now gripped by fear. And because of the resurrection, Jesus stands in front of that and says, I've overcome that fear. Anyone struggle with fear this week? Anyone struggle with fear over the last two years a little bit? Jesus says, I've overcome that. Why? Because the resurrection's true. Here Here it is. The resurrection is the definitive picture of joy over sorrow, of love over hate. And how much do we need that in our world today? The resurrection is the definitive picture of love over hate, and it is the picture of hope over hopelessness. All of those things, fear, anxiety, hatred, darkness, the resurrection stands in the face of these things, and Jesus says authoritatively, I have overcome it. I have overcome that. So eyes up. Here's the reality. Because the resurrection's true, eyes up right here. Not, wait, wait, watch this, kids. Where are you? Yep. Here it is. Ready? Everything in your life And everything in my life depends on how you respond to the resurrection. Everything depends on it. Initially, when you hear it, in coming to salvation, but then in the day-to-day, brothers and sisters in Christ who made that profession of Jesus Christ, everything in your life depends on how you respond to the resurrection. Day by day, moment by moment. It's not like, okay, I'm saved now, it doesn't matter to me. Oh, far from it. Everything depends on how you respond. But here's the problem that you and I face. Ready? Unbelief. Say it, unbelief. You and I have a major unbelief problem that we face every day. Why? Because we struggle or outright refuse to believe the truth of the resurrection and live in the power, peace, freedom, forgiveness, love, joy, strength, hope, and new life that Jesus offers us through it. 
Welcome to the greatest battle of unbelief you will face. And what's the result of this? Well, you just see it all around. You see it in your life. I see it in mine. We look around this world. We definitely see it. Fear. We live gripped by fear. Just name it. Fear of man. Anyone struggle with the fear of man? It's because of an unbelief in the resurrection and that power in that moment. Fear of man, fear of failure, fear of death. Anyone struggle with that? Man, we need the truth of the resurrection in our lives on the forefront of our minds and hearts every day. What, what else? What's the result of unbelief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Here it is in the power and new life he gives us. Anxiety. Anyone struggle with a bit of anxiety this past week? Maybe just me. How about this? Uh, conflict and hostility. We see that all in the church. We see it outside in the world. What's that from? Unbelief in the power of the resurrection. How about this? Confusion, brokenness, sorrow, and hopelessness. We have just summarized our world right now in one sentence. And maybe you're here today. We've got lots of people here. And maybe you're here, and today you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You're like, I could sing those songs that we just sang and proclaim the new life that I have in him. And maybe that's you today. Praise the Lord. But here's the problem that you face. You're not living in the resurrection power that he gives you, that he offers to you, because you're battling with unbelief in his power. You're battling with an unbelief in his promises, in his word that he's given, and the new life and the new identity that you have in him. And maybe you're here today and you're searching. You're like, I want to believe that what I just sung is true. I want to believe that there's something more than this. Is this world as good as it gets? Is this all there is for me? I want to believe the truth that if Jesus is truly the Messiah, I want life in him. Maybe that's you today. Praise the Lord, you're here. Or maybe you're here and you're skeptical about this whole thing. You're like, you guys are crazy singing songs like that, a pastor jumping around. That guy's nuts. Maybe that's you today. And you're like, you're like I can't believe that. What song? That guy rises from the grave. What? I've heard the truth of Jesus before. I come every Christmas and Easter. I've heard it before. And maybe that's true for you, but it's sure not true for me. Maybe that's you tonight. Praise the Lord, you're here. Or maybe you're here and you're just indifferent. Maybe you come under the authority of God's word and you're like, eh, sure, maybe Jesus is real, but I just want dinner out of this deal afterwards. Maybe that's you. I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at on that spectrum, maybe somewhere in between, I want to encourage you this. Bring all of that to Jesus today. Bring it all. Bring it all, the doubt and the unbelief, and genuinely ask him. Here it is, right here. You genuinely ask him to show you the truth, and you know what he's going to do? You know what he's going to do because he's faithful, that his word does not come back void? You know what he's going to do when you genuinely ask him to show you the truth? He's going to show it to you. He's going to show it. The question is, do you want to hear it? Do you want to receive it? Because it's not that it's not true. It's do you want to know the truth? And so may your prayer be right now, even the quietness of your seat right there, Lord, open my eyes, open my mind to understand the scripture today. Let that be your prayer right now. Watch what Jesus does. And you say, why does he care so much about me? Here's why. Because he created you and he loves you passionately. You say, I don't care about him. I don't love him. He loves you passionately. And he longs to show you the very big idea that is Easter, that is the big idea of this text. You'll see it on the screen. Write it down. He longs to show you and I today that Jesus has triumphed over death and all who believe in him will be given new life. Jesus has triumphed over death and all who believe in him, 
all who believe in him. Not like, I got to clean myself up first. I got to put a tie on. I got to like make sure that I can clean my sin up a little bit. No, no, no. All who believe in him will be given new life. No matter what you have done, no matter what you are doing, and Jesus totally knows, and you don't, what you will do. All who come to him will be given new life. This is the big idea of Easter, right here. Hey, kids, kids, eyes up again, right here. Eyes, I love you paying attention. This is amazing. Here's the reality. Look at this. When you go back to school, Lord willing, next week, and someone asks you, what's Easter all about? Don't answer don't answer this. Say, I won't answer this. Okay, good. Don't answer this. Uh, it's about a bunny. No. Sorry to like pop your rose. You're like, man, I wanted an egg hunt when I get home. Listen, no, it's not about a bunny. And don't say Easter is all about little chickens with half the eggshell on its head. And it's poking out. It's not about that either. Say, no, it's not. Here's what Easter's about. When your teacher asks you, what'd you learn about Easter? Jesus has triumphed over death. And all who believe in him will be given new life. Watch that moment. Mic drop. All right? Okay, great. Next person. There's the reality. And here in our text today, loved ones, we are going to see two truths we must believe if we are, get this, to know the truth of the resurrection and have life in Jesus' name. You ready to go? Oh, it's been Three years since the last time we've been gathered in person for Easter, we're standing to honor the authority of God's word, and we are reading this passage loudly and together. You ready to go? John chapter 20, 1 to 18. Let's go. Kids, open your Bibles nice and loud. Let's go. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed." For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Hear the word of the Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Well, here's the first thing we see here, loved ones. Jesus has triumphed over death, 
and the evidence is clear. You say, what evidence is clear? Here's the evidence. The evidence is clear that he's not here. Hey, can we say that together? That just sounds good. The evidence is clear. He's not here. He's not here. The evidence for the resurrection is clear. Will you see the truth and believe? There, there's the question that confronts you and I today. Will you see the truth and believe? Let's get our context. Here we are in Jerusalem, and it's dawn on Sunday morning. The first day, as you see in verse 1, it's the first day of the week. And here's the, here's the situation. Everybody's on edge. Have you ever felt on edge? Everybody's a little anxious. They're feeling on edge. They're fearful. They're doubting. They're worried. They're in confusion. These disciples don't know what to make of this. Their world's been turned upside down. Why? Because three days earlier, on the Friday, Jesus was crucified on the cross for the sin of the world, and he died and was buried, as we see right in our text today, in a garden tomb. He was buried in a garden tomb and has been in the grave for three days. Now watch this. Now this happened. Go back to the text. It's so good. Verses 1 and 2. Watch this. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. Who's Mary Magdalene? Why is, why is she so important in this section of scripture. While Mary Magdalene was one of Jesus's most devoted followers, as we see all throughout this text, Mary had some of the greatest longing and love for Jesus out of any of the disciples. Mary was a witness to Jesus's crucifixion and burial. You say, where do you know that from? Well, Mark chapter 15, Luke 23, tell us Mary saw Jesus killed and saw where he was buried. And so she comes to the tomb at dawn, and we know she came with other women. You say, how do you know that? Well, a few places. In the synoptics, she came with uh, Mary and Salome. And then even here in the text, notice verse 2, it says, and we do not know where they've laid them. She came with other women. Okay? She came with other women. Why? To finish anointing Jesus' body for burial. They had to hurry to get Jesus off the cross because the Sabbath was coming. All right? And so they had to take him down really fast, and they came to finish anointing him. But when she gets there, notice what happens. The stone is rolled away. And we're not talking about, here's a little stone. We'll just kind of kick it down the street. You'll see a picture. This is the actual garden tomb that they had believed Jesus was buried in. I've had worship services right there when I lived in Jerusalem. And it is magnificent to see. Here it is. This is what Mary's seeing. Put yourself in Mary's shoes. You're coming to the tomb with the spices. This is what you're seeing. And so here she is. She sees this tomb is rolled away, and we know from the Gospel of Matthew it was an angel that did it. And verse 2, you see in the text, when she sees this, she doesn't go in. She takes off. Mary takes off running and runs back to where the disciples were and tells Peter. What's the significance of Peter? Well, Peter was the head of the disciples. Okay? Peter's the leader of the disciples. So she goes to Peter and she goes to John. John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. We've seen that all the way out through this gospel. And what do they do? She tells them that they've taken Jesus' body and she has no idea where they've taken him. Now, eyes up here. Don't miss this. You want evidence of the resurrection? You want to know the truth of the resurrection? Everyone say, yeah, I do. Come on. Did you catch it in verses 1 and 2? Did you catch the evidence for the resurrection? Don't miss this. Here it is right here. Notice Mary's assumption. What's Mary's assumption when she sees that tomb? Is she like, praise the Lord, he's alive. Now what's her assumption? Here it is. She believes that the body was taken. She believes the body was stolen, not resurrected. Notice her own words. She looks at that picture and she's like, they've taken the Lord. He's not resurrected. They've taken him. Now recall this. Why is this so significant? 
Mary had just seen Jesus crucified and buried, and she was one of his most devoted disciples and in his inner circle. Mary knew what was going on. She had been with Jesus almost from the beginning. And if there was, hey, hey, here's one of the conspiracy theories that's really popular in Israel today, even and around the world, that the disciples stole the body. But notice this. If there was a conspiracy of the disciples to steal the body, like was being claimed in Matthew eleven thirteen, 13, uh, and to make others believe that Jesus rose, guess what? Mary would be in on it. Mary would know. She wouldn't be running home to say, they've taken the Lord. She'd be like, <laughs> pulled one over on them. She's not running back to say they've taken the Lord. She wouldn't be coming to the tomb with spices to finish anointing the body. She believes he's dead. There's no conspiracy here. And notice the other disciples. Look at under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the word of God says, Peter and John, inner circle, one of his closest three disciples, they would have been in on the conspiracy too. But guess what? Look how they respond. Look at verses three to six. Go back to the text. So good. So Peter, he hears this news and he went out with the other disciple and they were going towards the tomb. And both of them were running. So here's Peter and John sprinting to the tomb. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love John's humility. He's like, yeah, I totally smoked Peter. Anyway, there we go. Anyway, here we go. They're running into me. I beat him. But here we go. Verse five. And stooping to look in, what do they see? The linen cloths lying there. But he didn't go in. John doesn't go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. See, Peter and John take off running to the tomb to see this for themselves. Notice when Mary comes and said, they've taken the body. Peter and John aren't sitting there being like, yeah, we totally know. We orchestrated that. Shh. Don't tell anyone. Praise the Lord. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. They take off running. Peter, John beats Peter to the tomb, but he doesn't go in. And we see in verse uh, five, he just stoops and sees these burial cloths. And then Peter in verse six, he catches up, he gets there and he goes right in and he also sees these cloths. Now I want you to notice the detail. Did you catch it? Second evidence for the resurrection right here. You catch it? Verse seven. Watch. And the face cloth, the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head. They notice this. It's not lying with the linen cloths, but it's folded up in a place by itself. It's folded up. See, another argument that is commonly used to disprove the truth of the resurrection is that grave robbers took the body. It wasn't a conspiracy of the disciples. It was grave robbers. They came in, moved the stone, and robbed the tomb. Yet, did you notice from the text? You notice from verse 7? Grave robbers don't fold burial cloths neatly. When they ransack a tomb, they're not like, oh, I've got to make sure the corners are lined up. In fact, even today, to this date, they end up doing one of two things. When they rob a tomb, they either unwrap the burial cloths to steal what's buried with the body and get out in a hurry. They either do that's the first thing. Rip them off, grab any, because they would bury them with like uh, uh, treasure and money. And so they would take what they could, take the clothes, and then take off. They're not worried about folding clothes. They want to get in and get out. Or... Here's the thing. They actually don't unwrap the body at all. They steal the body and they carry it out in the cloths. Why do they do this? Because it's easier to transport. So they carry out the body with the cloths. It's all wrapped up, easy to transport. And then they dump it and then rip it apart and steal all the stuff. They're not leaving the clothes folded. And it's very clear right here. And this, these are just two evidences. You just look through the God. It's just all over the place. No body, and it wasn't stolen. And here's what it means by this. The body wasn't taken. There's no conspiracy here. It means, get this, ready? Eyes up. 
It means Jesus came out of those cloths, ready, on his own. I'm going to say it again. Jesus came out of those cloths on his own. He either unwrapped them himself, (laughs) amazing, or more weight to the evidence as we see in John 20 in a few weeks. Hey, come back to church. We're going to be talking about Jesus walking through walls. Or Jesus, get this, he came out all on his own by passing through those cloths with his glorified body. Just stop and think of the magnitude of that. And he folds the face cloth just to make sure everybody knows. Look at the detail of scripture. Kids, you don't have to abandon wisdom to believe in the truth of the resurrection. It's so clear. And these are just two evidences. Now, now notice this. I think Jesus can handle the linen cloths, don't you? He could handle the walls walking through locked rooms in John 20 that we're going to see the next two weeks, Lord willing. He can handle the cloths. And I want you to notice verses 8 to 10. Oh, wait, this gets better. Watch this. 8 to 10. Back to the text. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John talking about himself, also went in and he saw, and look at his response, and believed. He sees the cloths lying there. He sees the tomb empty, and he believes. For as yet they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples, they see this empty tomb, and what does it say? They go back to their homes. What happens here? John goes into the tomb. You want to see what the inside of the tomb looks like? There it is right there. Notice the message on the door. He's not here, for he is risen. And I've literally sat right beside that door and just thought about what John and Peter were experiencing in this moment. So that's gated off because that's where they believe Jesus' body was laid. Not here. The evidence is clear. He's not here. They go to the tomb. They see the burial cloths. And unlike Mary and Peter, notice John's response. Did you notice it? Mary and Peter are assuming someone had taken Jesus. But notice verse 8. John believes. John believes. That means the word, the Greek word for believes there is pistuo which means he affirms the reality of this. He puts his trust and faith that that's true. He believes that Jesus has risen, even though, as you see in verse 9, he doesn't understand everything yet. He doesn't understand about what God meant in his word as to why Jesus had to rise from the dead. He doesn't understand what it means that he'll have new life in him yet. But he knows God fulfilled his word as he always will. And John saw it and he goes home believing and with hope. But Peter and Mary, as we go on to see in the text, Peter and Mary, they saw the evidence right here. So clear. And they went home doubting. And they went home with the same sorrow, not believing what Jesus had told them, even though the evidence was right in front of them. Here's what we need to understand. Team, can you put that tomb pick back up, please? You say, well, wait a second. If Jesus could walk through his grave clothes, why on earth did he need to move the stone to get out? If he's walking through walls one chapter later, why does he need to get out with a stone moved? Well, here's the reality, loved ones. I think we see it pretty clearly. The stone was not moved so Jesus could get out. Jesus is quite capable of getting out. He created the rock. He can handle it. The stone was not moved so Jesus could get out. It was moved by that angel so the witnesses could get in. 
It was moved so the witnesses and for you and I could get into the tomb today and see the evidence is clear. We see evidence upon evidence that Jesus wasn't there. And notice how specific it is down to the detail of the face cloth. He had risen. See, the evidence for the resurrection is clear, but here's the question facing Peter, John, and Mary, and facing you and I today, will you see the truth and believe it? And I just wonder, I just wonder, I was thinking, I was preparing this, praying for all of you today. Um, many of us, how many of us right here today and online, watching online, love y'all online, miss you. How many of us are seeing this evidence year after year, hearing this preached year after year, but not believing the truth like Peter and Mary? And you hear the evidence, you see it, you hear the truth of God proclaimed, and you're just going back to your homes just like them. Unchanged. That's maybe for them, but it's not for me. How many of us right now are seeing this evidence and just going back to their homes? Doesn't matter to me. Hey, kids, kids, how many of you? Okay, here we go. Eyes up, eyes up, kids. I want you to put your hand up. You too, online. Here we go. I want you to put your hands up and I want you to answer this question. How many of you have ever heard before or read in a Bible that Jesus rose from the grave? Put your hands up. Oh, praise the Lord, parents. Way to go. Way to go. How many of you ever heard that? Okay. How many of you have heard that more than once? Great stuff. Yeah. Uncommon training. Here's the thing. How many of you kids are just going to go back to your homes today to say, what candy can I get? How many of you kids are going to say, great, I heard the resurrection story again. You see the evidence is so clear. Hey, tech team, put the inside of the tomb back up, please. You see this evidence that it's so clear, and you're like, I'm just going home. Hey, kids, I want to challenge you with this. Ready? Eyes up. Here we go, guys. Love ya. Eyes up. When you leave this church today, I want you to go home and ask your parents, what does it mean to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I want you to do that. Don't worry about the Easter bunny. It's not real anyway. Sorry, poke. <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. I want you to go home and I want you to ask your parents, what does it mean that the tomb was empty? Don't just go back to your homes like Peter and Mary. Believe like John, because Jesus loves you kids. And he says, let the children come to me. You don't have to wait till you're 50 to be like, okay, now I'm mature enough to accept Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you. And there's no junior Holy Spirit, kids. He wants you. Ask. Why was the tomb empty? And what does it mean to have a personal relationship with Jesus? You truly want to know the answer. Your parents will tell you that. You could have new life in Jesus today. Will this be the time you see it, loved ones, like John, and truly believe? You know, it's one of the tragic things about this up to this point in the text. John was the only one who went home with hope. Everybody saw it. Only John believed. Who are you? Who are you in this text? See, Jesus has triumphed over death and the evidence is clear. And you may say this, maybe you're here and you're skeptical about this whole thing. You've never confessed Christ. You're like, man, I don't want to have to sell out my reputation, all this stuff. Like, and you may say this, listen, okay, there's one thing. Okay, so the tomb's empty, but here's my question that needs answering. Where's the body? The disciples didn't take it. 
Grave robbers didn't take it, and it's definitely not in the tomb. Where's the body? Good question. Let's keep reading the text. Not only is the evidence clear, but notice the text, the truth is confirmed. Where's the body? Here it is. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus rose from the grave. Here's what this means. Here's what it means, kids, and offers you new life. But here's the question facing you tonight. It's the most important question of your life. Ready? Ready? Will you believe it and declare it? Will you believe it and declare it? Look at 11 to 13. Let's go back to the text right here. But Mary, notice, she saw the evidence, but she didn't believe. And here's the proof. She still stands weeping outside the tomb. She's still filled with fear and anxiousness and worry and sorrow. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Now she stoops down to look. And she saw, look what Mary sees. Peter and John didn't see this. Look what Mary sees. Two angels in white. Sitting. Notice the detail. Sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And look what they say to her right here. Look at this. They said to her, woman, not disrespectful, like woman, what's up? No. It's a term of endearment. It's woman, gentle, woman, respect. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping, Mary? And she said to them, they've, look at, she still believes. They've taken away my Lord. They've taken him away. I do not know where they have laid him. See what happens. Mary comes back to the tomb. So let's get our context. Make sure we're okay. Context is key. So Mary goes to where the disciples are. Peter and John come running. They look in the tomb. Mary's not running with them. They go back. Mary comes back to the tomb. We good? She comes back to the tomb. And because of her unbelief in Jesus being resurrected, she's still filled with sorrow and grief. Did you see it? And in verse 11, you see there, it says she's weeping. Circle the word weeping. Here's what it means. To cry aloud with uncontrollable grief. Anyone ever experienced a situation where you're just crying aloud? Uncontrollable grief? The death of a loved one? A friend? A hardship? I have. You can feel a little bit of what this is like. Here's Mary sorrow filled but then then something happens so we've had this physical confirmation jesus isn't there now god takes it up a level now it's the divine confirmation of the truth of the resurrection did you see the text show that picture of the empty tomb again please team watch this she's in here and notice what the text says She stoops in, and instead of just seeing the burial cloths, what does she see? She sees two angels sitting there. Now, when we think angels, let's make sure we're clear on something. Notice the detail of the angels. The word angel there means heavenly messenger. In Notice the detail? In white. So here's what John's describing. These are not your little cupids. Rosy cheeks, cute little curly toes with wings, little arrows. Is that what we're talking about? These are heavenly messengers. And the word white there, the Greek actually means dazzling, brilliant, powerful. What's it the picture of? It's the picture of God's glory. It's a picture of divine power. And notice, notice the posture they're in. Did you go back to the text? Did you catch it? What are the angels doing here? Are they panicking like, oh man, how are we going to solve this problem? They took Jesus. How are we going to like, are we folding clothes? How do we do this? No, they're not panicking. What are they doing? They're sitting there. Yo, Mary, what's up? <laughs> what's the posture of sitting? That's not a coincidence. The posture of sitting in ancient Israel was a posture of authority. This is divine power. Nobody took this body. This is an act of divine power. 
They're sitting where Jesus had laid. Now, why did they do this? To confirm that no one took Jesus' body and that he had risen by the supernatural power and sovereignty of God. No man-made effort rose Jesus to life. And as such, they ask her, look at this, this gentle rebuke. Here's what they say. Notice the gentle rebuke in verse 13. They say, right here, right here, read the text with me. Woman, why are you weeping? They're not condemning Mary. They're just gently correcting her. What, what, wait, wait. Why are you weeping, Mary? It seems kind of like a cold comment, doesn't it? She's in this grief. And they say, why are you weeping? Why are you sitting still in sorrow? Why are you still sitting in grief and in fear and anxiety? Here's what they're asking. Mary, here's what they're really asking right here. Mary, why are you choosing still the path of unbelief? Why, why are you choosing it, Mary? Why are you choosing it to doubt and why are you living? Here, here it goes. Let's expand on it because this is, this is the implications of this saying. Why are you choosing to continue living like something wrong has happened here? The body's taken. Why are you choosing to still believe like you have no hope and choosing to live like God's word isn't true? Why are you weeping and choosing to believe like you're, you're still enslaved to sin? Like Jesus can't be trusted, Mary. Like this is somehow outside of Jesus' sovereignty. Like, Mary, why are you still choosing to believe that you can't have the greatest forgiveness, peace, hope, joy, and life you could ever have and have it for eternity? Why are you still weeping? Why are you still sitting in your unbelief, Mary? Hey, loved ones. Then there's another visitor at the tomb, isn't there? Let's keep reading. This visitor is the one who gives the greatest confirmation right here to the truth and power of the resurrection that Mary could ever have. 14 to 16, watch this. Having said this, Mary doesn't answer the angels. She turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, this sounds familiar, Woman, very gently, why are you weeping? Why are you still sitting in your unbelief in me? Whom are you seeking? See, Jesus knows exactly who she's seeking. He wants to hear it from her. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, ready for this? Jesus said to her the sweet word that changed everything for her, Mary. He said, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi Uni, Rabbi Uni, which means teacher. Notice, notice this. From sorrow and uncontrollable grief in a word. Mary, Rabbi Uni! Rabbi Uni, it's you! Rabbi Uni! Rabbi Uni! Sorrow turns to joy in a moment. Rabbi Uni, Jesus comes himself to meet Mary at the tomb. She doesn't recognize him. No, verse 14. Now, before you go getting on Mary and say, like, what's up with her? Why couldn't she recognize him? Let's not forget a few things. Number one, the last time Mary saw Jesus, he had his flesh ripped off his back. He had a crown of thorns punched in his head, and he had a spear shoved in his side, not to mention nails and blood all over his face buried in the tomb. And we already know she's not expecting him to rise again. So she didn't, let's not, let's not get on Mary here. She didn't recognize him um, because also Jesus is in his glorified state. 
He doesn't look anything like that. He's got, he's got the scars. But he's in his glorified body. Oh, and, and another thing we could see as another reason that Mary didn't recognize him was because Jesus would have kept her from seeing him. As we go on to see later, as we see in Luke 24, he kept the disciples from recognizing him. Or it could be she just didn't expect to see him because she's still thinking his body's stolen. She's not even giving it a second thought. But notice verse 15. Jesus asks her the same question as the angels. He gives a gentle rebuke and adds this question. Who are you seeking? And Mary, in verse 16, mistakes him for the gardener, asks him to tell her where he's taking the body so she can take him and give Jesus a proper burial to which Jesus responds with one word. Mary. 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 And when she hears the voice of her precious Savior, when she hears the voice of her Messiah and the triumphant King, when she hears the voice of God Almighty, she turns and cries, How rabbi you knee! And notice what she does from verse 17. She clings to him. She clings. Don't believe me? Just look at the text. Verse 17. She clings to Jesus. And here, here's another evidence of the resurrection. Jesus is like, don't cling to me. She's clinging. I don't want to be separated from you again. Here I am. Here you are. I thought I'd lost you. And look what Jesus, here, here's it. the Holy Spirit, brilliant in how this is written. Look at the evidence for the resurrection here. Another argument against the truth of the resurrection is that all the disciples were just hallucinating. That they were just seeing visions and they were all like crazed out because they're all anxious and they had this big shock and so they're seeing things. You can't grab the feet of someone you're hallucinating about. And Mary grabs him, and she clings. The confirmation is received. And here's the truth we need to see. John 10, 27 says this. Those who are truly, those who are truly God's children will hear his voice and respond. John 10, 27, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. Those, even right now in this room, even watching online, those who are truly God's children will hear his voice and respond. It wasn't the physical evidence. It was the word of God. And Mary responds. And then Jesus doesn't stop there. Notice what he does. He gets right to it. Greatest mission of all time that you and I have right here, 17 and 18, as we land the plane, Jesus said to her, watch, look at this, look at this. Do not cling to me, Mary, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Notice the change. She goes from when she sees the empty tomb. They've taken the Lord, and now she bookends it with, I have seen the Lord. Sorrow turns to joy in the presence of the King of Kings, who is triumphant over death. Amen? She goes, I've seen the Lord. She tells that he had said these things to her. Now, let's unpack. This is a magnitude of a statement. Get your pens ready as we finish. When Jesus says, go and tell my brothers, why out of all the messages he could have given her to tell, why this? Why ascending to my brothers? Like, my God, your God. What's that all about? When he says not ascended, here's what he's saying. Mary, don't hold on to me because I need to go back to heaven. I need to go back to my father. Why? Because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, John 14 and 16. He goes, the comforter is coming. The helper is coming. The power for the mission I'm giving you is coming. You need to let me go, Mary. You need to let me go, and you need to go to my brothers. Now, we'll circle the word brothers. Circle. That's so key. Notice the change of position. Who's his brothers? The disciples. You need to go to my brothers. 
Go tell them that in that room they're locked in, full of fear, and tell them I'm going to my father who is now their father. I'm going to my God who is their God. And Mary went and proclaimed the news of the God. Are you and I? Mary went and proclaimed it. Are you and I proclaiming the news of the gospel? She proclaims it to the disciples by saying, I've seen the Lord. That's awesome. Now notice two things. I told you to circle the word brothers. Here's why. Because this is the only time in the gospel of John, right here, verse 17, the only time in the gospel of John where Jesus refers to his disciples as his brothers. It's not a coincidence. It came right after the resurrection. What has happened? Their position has changed. He calls them his brothers. And notice he doesn't stop there. Keep going in verse 17. He says, I'm ascending to my father and your father. Notice that? This is the only time in John's gospel where almighty God is referred to as being the father of the disciples. You see what happened here because of the resurrection? There's a new position through Jesus Christ that they have before God. It's crucial and it's beautiful to understand because now from Jesus' resurrection, defeating the power of sin that separates us from God, all who repent of their sin and believe in him are given a new life, new identity, and new position and standing in him. As they now have peace with God and are part of his eternal family, for all who believe in Jesus Christ as their Messiah, they now have a perfect father. God is their father. Just as God, the father, is Jesus' father. Did you see that in the text? My father, your father. That's oh, incredible. Here's what this means. It means Jesus is our Lord, but notice verse 17. He's also our brother in the eternal family of God. Happy Easter. Amen. Amen, loved one. This world, if you are saved in Jesus Christ, this world is no longer your home. This world is not as good as it gets for you. And you say, well, what does this mean, this new life? Okay, last slide. Get, well, third last slide. Get your pens ready. Number one, here's what new life in Jesus means, what he's unpacking right here, verse 17. New acceptance by God. Write down these verses. We're not going to unpack each of them. Write them down. John 6, 37. New acceptance by God. God accepts you into his family, and he will not allow you to be snatched away from him. He accepts you, not because of your performance, but because of what Jesus has done for you on your behalf in paying the penalty for your sin. He accepts you. He goes, you bring that to me. You come to me. I will give you new life. Here it is. And it's not because you're good enough, but because Jesus was. Here's what new life means, new acceptance, but he makes you a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. A new creation. And it's not just like God gives you a little polish but leaves all of the muck and mire and enslavement of sin in your life. No, no, no. He makes you new. He gives you a new heart. Takes out a heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. Here it is, what it means right here. New identity, Ephesians 1.5. Hey, you want to have true freedom? Here it is. You no longer are a slave to who this world says you are. You are no longer a slave to who this, your performance says you are. You are now in Jesus Christ who God says you are. And he says, you are my beloved child and I love you. You are not defined by this world anymore. What freedom! How many people, even in this room right now, are trying to live up to the expectations of this world that can't, you can never do it because you're only as good as your last performance? Not in Jesus Christ. Not in Jesus Christ. 
You're given a new identity, but not only that, you're given a new hope. Romans 15, 13, that you may abound in hope. You've been given a living hope. It's not a hope that based on which of your sports teams wins the cup, or do we get the vaccine that eliminates COVID for all time, or does the war in Ukraine stop? It's not based on that. It's an unshakable hope that is based on the work of Jesus Christ that is yours for eternity. That is unshakable, no matter what is coming. Here it is. Ready, ready for this? New hope. Also, new life in Christ means new joy. New joy in God's family. John 15, 11, Jesus says, My joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. Fullness of joy. You can stop trying to run around to this world and be like, well, if I get the vacation, I'll have more joy. If I get the money, I'll have more joy. If I get the family, I'll have more joy. If I get the house, I'll have more joy. You won't. Come to Jesus Christ and you will know the fullness of joy because you share in his joy that he has in the Father. Here it is. New peace, new identity, new life means new peace. John 16, 33. This is true peace. Jesus says, not like this world I give you. My peace I leave with you. It's not like this world gives you. It's an unshakable peace. Even when the earth totters and quakes, you can be grounded in the peace of eternity. The peace of God. Notice this. New life means new freedom. John 8, 36. Freedom from the slavery of sin. That addiction that you're struggling with right now, Jesus has overcome that. And as you repent of your sin and confess him as Lord, he frees you from that. John 8, 36 says, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. What about my anger and impatience and my alcohol and my addictions and my pornography and all that? Jesus has overcome it. Amen? New freedom. It has no power over you anymore. Here's another one. Ready? New confidence. New confidence. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Your performance doesn't define you. There is no condemnation for you in me. You are my brother. You are my sister. You are a child of God. Here's what it means. New intimacy. New intimacy. Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. You will never walk alone. I don't know how many times I've been so comforted that over these last two years of pandemic. Jesus says, you will never walk alone again. I am with you in the hardship, in the struggle, in the tears, in the sorrow. You will still have suffering in this world, but you will not go through it alone. And here's what it means. New courage. New life means new courage. I love 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, for you did not receive from Jesus Christ a spirit of fear but a spirit of power and love and self-control. That spirit of fear right now, for the people in this room watching online, that's gripping your heart, and you're like, I'm so afraid of this and afraid of this. That's not from the Lord. It's not from him. Just take the authority of God's word. He did not give you and I a spirit of fear if you are saved in Jesus Christ, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. We can have new courage no matter what comes. And lastly on our list, but there's so much more. Take time this week, loved ones, to go through eternal life. Eternal life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, say it, let's say it together, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. New life in Jesus. New identity, new position, new status. This is the new life we're given by his grace through faith. And you can't earn this. And here's the question. Jesus rose from the grave and offers you new life. Will you believe and declare? There it is. And if you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your personal savior, Romans 10, 9, I want you to hear this today. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Is that you? Maybe that's your first step. Right, right, right where you're sitting. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you. The evidence is so clear. It's so confirmed. I can't run anymore. I don't want to go back to my home today without making a right decision today. Will you confess? Repent of your sin. 
confess him as the son of God, only Messiah, Lord and Savior, and believing that peace with God and eternal life is found through him alone. And that apart from him, only death and separation from God in hell for eternity await. Will you believe and declare him as Lord? For the wages of sin is death. It's so clear right here, loved ones. But the free gift, salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it. It's by his grace. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Will you come to him today? And brothers and sisters, here's two applications we close with. Number one, will you believe the truth of the new life and identity you have in Christ? Are you, what, as you look at that list, what are you refusing to believe? Where are you walking in your unbelief? Will you live day by day in light of that new identity and the resurrection power that is yours in him? Where do you need to repent of your unbelief? And secondly, it doesn't stop with you. Will you declare, like Mary, the beautiful, life-changing, life-saving truth of the gospel to those around you saying, no more doubt, like Mary, I have seen the Lord. Come and see. Who has Jesus put around you to do this? Believers and non-believers. Loved ones, here's the truth. As I call the worship team up, here's what all this means. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of the truth of the resurrection, right here, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Jesus has triumphed over death. Evidence is clear. Truth is confirmed. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, you are the way and the truth and the life. And none comes to the Father but through you. It's so clear. And I pray right now for everyone here in this room and everyone watching online, from the youngest child to the oldest adult, Lord, that we wouldn't just go back to our homes right now. It's decision time. It's decision time. Will I choose to see the evidence and believe like John did? Or will I go home hopeless again, grieving, sorrowful, trapped, enslaved in my sin? And for those of us who've made that confession already, will we choose to walk and will we walk by faith clinging to you in humble dependence in the new life you've given us in the power of the resurrection? And will we declare it to a world that is lost and broken and hurting and desperate for the news of a living hope? Lord, empower, empower us for this. Draw men and women to yourself and now empower our praise in response to you as our living hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Loved ones, will you stand and let's respond.